Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. For I meet politicians and grafters by the score. Killers plain and fancy, it's really quite a bore. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. They wallow in corruption, crime and gore. Tingling ling, city desk, full the press, full the press, extra, extra read all. The about Media Project it. has some commentary and analysis for you on what's going on on the news media in recent days, and we invite you to join us for this next half hour. I'm Rex Smith from the Upstate American, formerly editor of the Times Union, with some other noted journalists here. We have Judy Patrick, former editor of the Daily Gazette, now the vice president of New York Press Association. We have investigative journalist Rosemary Armeo, also in many classrooms as a college professor over the years, and Dr. Alan Shartok, Professor Emeritus of Communications, CEO of Northeast Public Radio. Are you okay, Dr. Shartok? I think so, but this business of emeritus is very interesting to me. I just hope there's not a knock on the door and they say, you've been emeritus so long that we are now taking your doctorate away from you. Oh my. <laughs> well, it just means that you retired with merit, you know, that's all, right? Emeritus. Yeah. Emeritus, yes. He, he has it. So it's a title of distinction. But we turn first to this issue that's very interesting that we have had this mass shooting once again. We've had children slaughtered in schools, which happens with astonishing regularity. Thousands of school children, hundreds of thousands of children in the years since Columbine have actually experienced violence in their schools. And yet, of course, the difficulty is you can cover the impact of it, but the solutions to it become then an issue of political journalism because that's where the solutions break down. So, Dr. Shartok, shootings in schools become a political story, yet you run the risk of leaving behind the empathetic element that might make a difference here. Look, Rex, it's a terrible thing when a child is shot or something happens in a place that you have sent your child to where you are going to assume safety. And so it becomes a huge story because it could happen to anybody. And it really makes it uh, quite difficult for those of us who have to deal with this. But it's, you know, Rosemary, when you're covering something of this magnitude that is this damaging to a community, it's hard to get your head out of the moment and write about the long-range impact, what might make yeah, a difference. Yeah, I've been praising all week a piece put into the Washington Post. It actually was on the same day of the shooting. It was not in reaction to it, but, you know, it's hard to figure out when to run these stories because we have shootings every week now like this. And what it was is called the blast effect, and it took two actual children victims. One was a little 6-year-old killed in Sandy Hook, and the other was a 15-year-old. And it showed actual pictures of them in life. And then with an animated display, showed what the bullets that hit their bodies actually did inside. Mm -hmm. And it is disturbing and horrifying. And I don't know what more the press can do to make people think about going in, someone deliberately going into a school and aiming AR-15s at little bodies like these. The, the kids killed in Nashville this week are the same age as my granddaughter. Last week I went to have lunch with her and her school it was like getting into Fort Knox to get in because schools now have to be like the little mini fortresses. And I was sitting there with all these tiny little children from the, you know, the lower grades thinking about what that must be like. People have been impacted by the video released by the police and put out by the news. Only snippets, not the real horrifying stuff in it. Just big, giant guys, cops, with huge guns going through a hallway with little children's drawings. I think the media has shown how horrifying this is. And if there's lack of empathy, it's because we've just seen so much of it. Actually, incidentally, it is interesting how powerful that is as a, an electronic medium. Yeah. So when people say to me, I still read the newspaper and print, I think, well, okay, thank you very much. But yeah. the more powerful journalism these days is digital, and we need to recognize that and not be wedded to the print page. In people any have, case, People have pointed <laughs> out that you can hear the anxiety, the adrenaline, and the voice of these men who, and I'm a big critic of cops, but these guys were heroes, and they just went, were going right to where the shooting was. They run up the stairs, and they actually then, 
and shoot the shooter, although that's not shown any place, nor should it be. But those moments show exactly what the police are facing, what people in the school are facing. It's hugely impactful journalism. So, Rosemary, why shouldn't it be shown? If you show it, wouldn't that be a turnoff for those who might turn to it otherwise? I don't know. Haven't we proved in this country that killing bad guys is not a deterrent to future bad guys, whether it's state-sponsored or in the course of a police action? We, we turn on these kind of shows for entertainment. Cops killing someone in the act of committing a crime are the mainstay of all the police shows that are so popular. So, no, I don't think it would have any effect. I don't think we should be doing that. You know, there's divided opinion about two videos. So there were two videos released as a result of the Nashville shooting. One showed the police officers entering the building and acting Mm -hmm. heroically. The other one showed the assailant shooting through the glass door and walking through the halls. There are some people who are who would argue that that video should not be given as much play as it has been given, that it is glorifying what this person did. So it's interesting, but most people support the police entering the building. They say watching the assailant walk through with two guns through those same halls right. more or <laughs> less gives the person a higher stature than they deserve. Those gun companies could use that as a commercial. Hey, see how cool you are. There's something to be said for that. and. One of the things that journalists should be doing is holding manufacturers of guns to account. How do you do that when the public officials will not? You know, the press conference of the House Republican majority, the weekly press conference happened to coincide with this shooting. And so Steve Scalise was asked with, by the way, local congresswoman Elise Stefanik right at his side, was asked, what can you do? And he said, well, in these moments of stress, what I do first is I pray. Yeah. And, you know, we can't do anything. And John Cornyn, who is the Republican senator from Texas, who did sponsor that little gun control bill that everybody thought was such a big deal last year because can't get anything else. John Cornyn said, I think we've gone about as far as we can go. Yeah. You know, this is not unlike other situations the press has been in. When the tobacco companies were killing people, knowing they were killing people, putting out a product that was killing their customers, they shut down the press and there was investigative reporting that revealed what was going on. Before the civil rights movement took over, there were huge abuses of racial inequality and reporters trying to report on it were ridiculed, kept out of print, even by their own editors, and they persisted. And we need to do that now. Gun control, gun regulation, gun culture is a huge beat in the United States. I'm taken with your term, shut down the press. How do they do that? They say, we can go. We've done everything. This is impossible. No, there's nothing to see here. Congress shut down research on gun violence, and it's been shut down for a long time. So you cannot, as a scientist, even do research on the effects, say, of gun violence in small communities. That's not a study that will be done. collect the information, in fact, under the Tiart Amendment, as it was called, named after a congressman named Mr. Tiart. It is illegal for for government agencies to collect data on gun violence. For example, the Washington Post has done reporting that gives us the number of school shootings, but the government doesn't compile those numbers because right. Congress doesn't allow it. This kind of thing, the problem is that it gets you in conflict with this journalistic notion of fairness or objectivity. You know, is a reporter supposed to say to Congressman Scalise or to Congresswoman Stefanik standing there adoringly next to him, you're evading the issue? Can you ask that question, Judy? Yeah, you can say, that's not the issue. The issue is this. What is your response to that? I think that political reporters have gotten into a rut of just taking both sides or not going further. They just take the crazy comment, the thoughts and prayers comments, and shake their heads and walk away instead of trying to nail them down. In many respects, that's a fault of the exchange platform they have. They don't have a lot of time to ask questions, but um, I think they need to do a, a much better job especially from the political realm. I think on the other end of the situation, Washington Post, Rosemary's story was one she mentioned about the blast yeah. effect. They also talked to AR-15 owners and asked them why do they own these guns, and they did some history about how this gun became popular right. and how it became commercially marketable after so many years. So I think from that realm, I think the journalism is doing a good job. But politics is always hard to cover. It's always hard to nail politicians down. Getting through the truth when it comes to talking to a politician is sometimes impossible. I wish I could remember where I read this. Maybe you'll recall it. But some reporter went to a bunch of clergymen and talked about prayers and thoughts. You know, and thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Was that effective? Is that really what you know God would like? And it was. I thought it was devastating because, of course, they recognize it for what it is. It's hypocrisy. It isn't anything meaningful it's a way to avoid taking a hard step. I have to say, I'm glad I'm not a reporter anymore because it's so hard. Because since we have gotten to a point where American politicians lie with impunity, 
and where we don't have any standards of almost of decency now. It's very hard to hold people to account when lies have become the currency of one side of a political debate. And I am sympathetic to journalists who are in a situation where uh, everybody that they are covering, in, in states, for example, where there is a strong Republican majority, where how can you cover this kind of thing when you know that what you are hearing from the people in positions of authority is untrue, scientifically questionable? Look at Iowa, for example, or the other states where they recently have enacted laws to block the care for trans children, gender affirming care, which the American Medical Association says is the right kind of care. And yet the politicians have enacted this because it speaks to some sort of a political issue for them. I don't know. Hate people who are not like us. Um, exactly. And how do you break through that if you're a journalist trying to reach a whole audience, trying to speak to your community, and yet you know there's so many people in your community who ascribe to these values. And what are the owners and the editors going to do when they see you struggling with this? It can carry a reporter away. It wasn't that long ago that in upstate New York we were having the dilemma about whether or not to allow transgender students to use ba what bathrooms to use or what locker rooms to use. Mm. And if you really talk to the people in the schools, this was not an issue. This was not something that needed to be discussed at school boards. But you would have a big crowd that would come, and and the reporter would come back and think, well, do I need to cover this or not? And it took off. It, it acquired a life of its own. And in some respects, all of this rhetoric about transgender, this fear-mongering, is moving the needle. Recent polls showing more people in America are against medical care for transgender um, youth than they were 10 years ago. And so... The rhetoric is driving the opinion, and the opinion is driving the rhetoric in an obscene way. The, the, you know, this is not a new problem in journalism. A hundred years ago, Pulitzer talked about journalism having to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted, and who the afflicted are changes over time. Right now, it is trans people. They are targeted. They are the subject of incredibly cruel, not just thoughtless and unscientific, but cruel policies. And it's up to the media to cover that, to keep a strong spotlight on it no matter what their readers say and that's the hardest part I mean I can remember as a young reporter writing about here in Albany County the sheriff's department was not going to allow any more gift packages going to prisoners I thought that was ridiculous you know it, it didn't cost them anything people were donating it groups were donating it and prisoners were being deprived of just like some small little comfort people hated that they didn't want prisoners to get it they don't like prisoners they don't like convict that's what we're dealing with now and the media has never been very good at getting like ahead of public opinion because we're business based but this is the public trust part of our job well it's not even business i think not for profit media are probably better at it than the for profit media but mm -hmm. that's because most of the funding for not for profit media comes from liberal sources, right. from a generous left-wing donors. So these newsrooms... It's all uh, Soros. Yeah, it's all Soros, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or was it Soros? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> one of those guys. But that makes it, I suppose, to Alan's question, what about the owners? If your publisher wants you to reach an entire community, or if you think that your ethical goal is to serve the entire community, it does make it more difficult to stand up for, I guess, the oppressed people. You know, it actually is religion, frankly. All these devout Christians, supposedly, who are in Congress, who are espousing hatred, really aren't paying attention to the uh, scripture. But I don't suppose you can point that out in the pages of a commercial newspaper, a secular Why? organ. <laughs> well, you can, but not in your reporting, I suppose. Not no, as that's, a straight that's an opinion reporter. Piece, yeah, analysis. I guess that's an opinion. That's why I write only opinion these days. I mean, it is so much. It is much easier. It is much You're easier. You're right about you know? that. But I feel guilty because I'm only, you know, preaching to the choir, to keep the religious analogy going, because I realize that the only people who read my stuff are people who agree with me. So that gives you a certain freedom, but it doesn't help the reporters who are out there doing the hard work of trying to decipher what's true and share that with their readers. Well, when it comes to transgender people, we should talk about the shooting in Nashville where 
the media got ahead of itself, especially the right-wing media, to right. assume that the, the shooter was transgender. At this taping, they still have not determined for sure what, what the gender identity of the shooter was. Some people leapt to the conclusion that the person was transgender and identified her as such, and then the right-wing media right away linked the fact that this person they said was transgender with the fact that they went into a Christian school and shot children. So, And that was amplified by politicians like Marjorie Taylor Greene who immediately said, what kind of medicine for you know her gender identification was this person on? Did that have an effect? She was punished for that by Twitter and bumped off a while. Elon Musk was encouraging this, though. So there is a connection between the right-wing media and politicians. Hard to blame people who think the same must not be true on the liberal side because it does exist. And you're right. And let's point out, how many times did you ever see a headline that said, white boys are the ones who are killing people in schools. we got to do something about them. And yet one trans person, a woman is an unusual shooter. 98% of all school shooters have been white boys. And yet the one transgender, and you're, you're seeing the headlines that you talked about, the New York Post had transsexual. Trans okay, could you explain to our listeners why that is? Why it's mostly male? Who are the shooters? Why the press picks up and makes these kinds of Because accusations. news is based, one of the values of news is unusual. If it's out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. it's That's news. Right. Yeah. And trans themselves are unusual. That is not, as you point out, that is not like us. They're different. There was a shooting at an army base, and the headline the next day was Middle Eastern soldier suspect. You didn't see the ethnic background uh, of any other person. Black suspects are always identified by race, whereas whites are not. It is an inherent bias in our reporting. But what about, uh, and I've presented this line a lot over the years, that yes, we cover that which is an exception to normal, and that's why we cover crime, because crime is outside the realm of the ordinary when we live in a good, stable society. But the result of our coverage of crime, uh, which is sort of the basic coverage of every newsroom, is that it gives people the impression that there is more crime Danger. than there is, when in fact that is not the pervasive element of everyday life. So should we as journalists be looking away from crime? Should we say not every shooting should be covered, not every homicide even should be covered? Is it something that we need to back away from instead of saying this is sort of the cop's beat is the fundamental beat of the newsroom? You can cases? imagine what your editor might say when the competitor gets a jump on you if you don't cover something because you don't think it's right to do it. Yeah. But, but we had this issue in Schenectady where we had really good cops reporter who wrote a lot of stories. And there were so many stories that they would dominate the covers and they would dominate the website. And so you saw this flood of crime stories, which would lead you to believe that Schenectady was crime ridden. When it had crime, but it was not crime ridden, we're also seeing the attachment of mugshots to a lot of stories because stories online especially need a piece of art to go with them. And a mugshot worked really well. But the downside to that is the website gets flooded with images of mostly people of color because those are the people who are being arrested in cities and getting their mugshots taken. People get arrested out in the countryside and they're not of color, uh, but often we don't have their mugshots and so those aren't getting in the paper. So there's an institutional bias that gets built into the system. If you get arrested for a federal crime, often you're not gonna get a mugshot released to the press. Those mugshots aren't gonna get in the paper if you're accused of defrauding a bank, for example. There's also an economic issue here. Newspapers especially, but other outlets too, are starved for resources and cop reporting is the cheapest there is. Yep. You send your baby reporters there, you need no experience. The cops spoon feed you what they want to see in the newspaper and they come back and dutifully type it up, even using the same stupid jargon of cops, you know, and a murder is an incident. Somebody an is incarcerated. Right. E exited right. the vehicle. Yeah. Yes. They even <laughs> a contusion. It's, it's like stenography and that requires action by editors and newsroom leaders to ferret out that, to tell a story of not just a shooting or a break-in in a neighborhood, but what about that neighborhood lends itself to being broken into. This is a heinous crime, but let's look overall at the statistics of break-ins here. We don't point out how incredibly unusual it is to have say a murder involving a, in Albany here, a, a medical health care worker was, his home was invaded and he was held, tortured and killed. That's huge headlines and 
does that not deserve it just because it's so incredibly unusual? That's why it was a story, and we don't point that out. But it's cheap for a TV station, for example, to send a good-looking young reporter to stand in front of yellow police tape at a crime scene and do a live shoot hours after there was actually anything to show there. But that's just the nature of the coverage. Oh, it's much more interesting if you have a live shoot and put this good-looking young person with the wind tousling hair in front of uh, this crime scene, and that's journalism. Well, yes. it is, but it's irresponsible journalism. Yes. It really And politicians this. have taken advantage of this, as we know only too well, where fear of crime becomes a driving force in elections. We saw that in New York this yeah. past election for governor. Absolutely. I would so. also argue against the, the quirky cop story, like the, the person who's arrested for stealing, you know, shrimp or lollipops and that makes a, a kind of a bright or a stupid criminal story we often do that because oh that is unusual and uh, <laughs> uh and you know we should put that in but we don't realize that you know somebody made had a made a stupid mistake it's not a big crime even though it is unusual but it's going to follow them for the rest of their life and do we really want to put it in the paper when there are other fish to fry other than shrimp to steal, <laughs> yes. The, uh, to your point about uh, following people for years, we ought to make a note here that there is now, with the rise of digital journalism being the fundamental way that people get information, people are increasingly asking newsrooms to remove from their websites any reference to old stories, to crimes. And there is a justice initiative to seal the criminal records of people to sort of wipe out their prior crimes if they stay on and behave well for years. And we might describe the response to that in newsrooms. It used to be that my fundamental response and people said, would you strike that from your website was no. And now there's a sort of mid ground, right? It's called de-indexing, mm -hmm. where you remove access that is, if you Google Alan Shartok, uh, timesunion.com, you will not find, you know, the crime that Alan committed. Which was none. <laughs> I'm making this up, of yeah. course, by the way. This makes it harder for things. Right? You put it in a special frame, and it makes it harder for it to be found. It's still there, but you have to make an argument for it. I think there has to be a good faith effort by the person who wants something removed to show why it, it is. And it, it can be cumbersome. But in their support, oftentimes we will report arrests, but we never report dispositions of a case. So uh, we have hundreds and thousands of arrests out there, but we never follow. We just don't have the manpower to follow things through court and see what happens. And that happened during my years at the Times Union. We started running uh, police blotters uh, like the old, like the little newspapers used to years ago. And a few months into it, I realized we're never going to follow up on this stuff. We actually have all this data. So we dropped the names. And then that's still, then you end up sort of, impugning people who are innocent by because you're not naming those who are allegedly guilty and you just you get into such trouble if you end up saying i'm just going to be a stenographer and report whatever the cops give us the better idea is to really use valid judgment we ended up dropping that feature once we realized that it was really ethically eh, once we realized why did we not understand this from the get-go <laughs> i um, <laughs> Too in, in, smart. in europe there is a movement it's called the right to forget and that you're actually Required to get rid of some of this material, this old, old court cases and very minor charges. I think it's a slippery slope. De-indexing is less troublesome because at least it's still there. But if it happened, it's reportable. I mean, I still go back to your original idea to take it out. No, did it happen? If it's an accident, I will add to it. If you if you say yes, we didn't follow it, and you want another story or send in a letter yep. to the editor, I will print that, but no, that's censorship. Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> the, well you see folks, listeners, how uh, many slippery slopes there are and how many judgment calls have to be made in this. If you'd like to share your views, media at wamca.org is how you can give us the uh, your reaction. Alan Shartok is here, Rosemary Armeo, you just heard from Judy Patrick and I'm Rex Smith. One of the things we need to do is just talk about bravery among reporters, uh, most, Notably uh, present as we speak, a Wall Street Journal reporter in Russia is in custody, accused of espionage. The reporter's name is Evan Gershkovich, and uh, he's a young man who had started his career as a news assistant, sort of a clerk at the New York Times, and became a correspondent. And Russia now is detaining him. And this is seen as an 
escalation of tensions between the countries, but think about the reporter, the family, think about what the newsroom is going through, and I think it just reinforces the notion that reporting can be hazardous, can be dangerous. And how many reporters who get caught up in this kind of thing knew going in uh, what the potential downside was? Rosemary, you've done it. You've been around. I, I think he knew and accepted it. He also is covering the military-industrial complex in Russia. There cannot be a more dangerous assignment. I think he knew full well he was doing, and I applaud him. I, I'm amazed all over the world at journalists who know the risks, know the risks even to their families, too, and still do the stories that there's something more important than their own safety. They are patriots, and I wish they got more attention and glory for what they do. That's... I wish him the best. He is now a pawn in a geopolitical fight between Russia and the United States, as was our basketball player not long ago. Mm -hmm. You know, shortly after they invaded, Russia invaded Ukraine, Russia enacted tougher laws against journalists, and uh, many, especially American news organizations, withdrew from Russia. They've slowly returned in some respect, but they've always been un operated under tight concerns. But um, this reporter was out, was not in Moscow. He was out in the field doing uh, some real work, and I shudder to think what's going to happen to him in the weeks and months and years to head. It's not just Russia either. We had a reporter killed in Las Vegas in our own in our own country. Journalism is increasingly not just underpaid and undersupported by the public, but dangerous. Well, and you have to worry about it as the political stakes heat up in this country yes. and as the uh, rhetoric of Donald Trump and his little uh, imitators continues to target journalists. You have to worry that some of these supporters are going to come after the journalists uh, and that it will become even more dangerous in this country. Well, with that, we are kind of out of time, oh, so boy. we have to stop. Uh, but we do hope for the best, of course, for this reporter, and we are grateful to those who actually go out on the front lines and get the news for us every day, domestically and abroad. Alan Shartok, Rosemary Romeo, Judy Patrick, and I'm Rex Smith with gratitude to our producer, David Gustina, and to you folks for joining us once again this week here on The Media Project. When they know they've got a people's fight to wage ting ling ling newspaper guild Got a free new world to build Meet the people, that's a thrill All together fits the bill oh, The Media Project is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. Alan Shartok is CEO of WAMC, Professor Emeritus at the State University of New York, commentator, columnist, and author. Rex Smith is the former editor of the Times Union and Substack columnist. Judy Patrick is the vice president for editorial development for the New York Press Association. Association, and Rosemary Mail is an investigative journalist and adjunct professor at RPI. Listen to The Media Project online anytime at wamc.org or schedule a podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Or just download the WAMC app for your iPhone or Android at the Play Store today. Thanks for listening. I don't know. Ting -ling -ling, circulation, ting -ling -ling, advertising, get those readers, get that payoff. What a headache, what a mess. Oh, publishers are such interesting people. Let's give free cheers for freedom of the press.